going to hand over to Sheila and just a quick introduction to Sheila McNeil. We're delighted to have you back, Sheila, in Galway. I know you actually have been in Galway, which is great. You've been with us before uh, in the Institute and you were with us online also as well when we started off on our digital ed journey. So, Sheila, once again, fabulous to have you here. You've over 20 years experience within education and I know you're working as a consultant now as a, an open educator keynote speaker and an artist as well, something that's uh, very interesting about, you know, your background. So uh, Sheila's going to share with us today um, her experience over the last year and give us lots of food for thought. And um, as I said, she's lots of experience in curriculum design, assessment, feedback, learning analytics. There's so much that you've been involved with in lots of projects in higher education. So thanks, Sheila, for being with us today to share with us. I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Karina, and thank you, Michael, for that introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you all today. Obviously, um, I am just I'm going to get my screen up to start sharing. I'm disappointed that I can't be with you in person in Galway, but um, as Karina said, I have been with you before. Um, can you all see my screen? Yeah, can. Yeah, Karina, can you just let me know if you can see my screen? Not just. Yes. No. Not yes. Not oh. yet. Just give it a second. Oh. Hang on. I knew this this would happen. Here we go. I think it might happen. Can you see it now? Yeah. Coming up yeah, now. Great. Okay. Perfect. So great. So thanks everybody. I knew that it was going to take a little couple of minutes just to get get things up and running. So, um, yeah. I'm as I said. I'm delighted to be here. At this point, I can't be here in person, but it's great to see, um, as Michael said, that, you know, so many people from across Ireland um, and beyond are, are with us today as well. So if you want to just keep putting in the chat where you are and obviously put in, you know, the, the real time weather updates, which I, I love about uh, online conferences now, <laughs> you see where the weather is all over the world. Um, now, last year when I presented um, at, at this event, I was kind of looking at potential models for sharing practice. Um, I don't know about you, but last year, last year, it feels like almost like a, a lifetime ago, not just a year. My kind of notions of time have changed quite a lot in the last 12 months. Um, but I thought this year, after a year um, of, you know, living um, basically online, I thought we could take some time just to reflect on what we've um, actually learned over the past year. Um, and, you know, but I think one of the things I want to look at at the beginning as well is exploring that experience because it's quite it's largely been a solitary experience for us all because we've all been remote. We've been remote from our campuses, we've been remote from our colleagues, we've been remote from our students. But at the same time, as we have at times maybe been a bit too close to some of our family as well when we were all working and homeschooling, um, particularly the beginning of lockdown. Um, and although technology has enabled us to be in some ways, air quotes, alone together, the past year has been a really different experience for working, for living and for learning for, for everyone. So when I was preparing for this talk, I thought I would look for some inspirational quotes because you always, you always got to have an inspirational quote, quote in a keynote, don't you? Um, and I came up with a few that I just want to share with you is my... Um, ah... Uh, here we go. Uh, yes, so it's a bit slow, sorry, moving forward there. So here we are from Pablo Picasso, without great solitude, no serious work is possible. And of course, one of the things I've been looking at um, when I was thinking about this was words like isolation, like alone, like quarantine, all the words that are so much more commonplace in our vocabulary and in our discussions now that pre-pandemic really weren't. Um, so, um, yes, another one from, from Voltaire, you know, the happiest of lives is a busy solitude. Now, I'm not sure how that would resonate with some of you who I know have been working incredibly long hours over the past year, partic participating in endless rounds of online meetings. Not quite sure that was kind of a busy solitude that Voltaire could ever have ima imagined or whether that was a happy solitude at times either. Now, as ever, when you're looking for these um, quotes, uh, it always seems to be the white European dudes that come up first. So in the interest of balance, we'll get some, uh, uh, a female perspective. But, you know, Mary Sarson, she's saying, loneliness is the poverty of the self. Solitude is the, rich of, the richness of the self, which is quite chin-stroking, isn't it? But 
what really struck me about these quotes, and in fact, all the quotes that I was looking at um, for this, was um, how out of time and out of context they actually seem right now. Because in all of them, there's this kind of sense of kind of a noble sacrifice involved in, in solitude and the greatness of any endeavour, artistic or whatever, is, is through solitude. Um, and they had to justify that through this these these statements um and just now i feel that that feels like quite a rarefied a very distant privileged concept really from a bygone era because um as we all know <laughs> enforced solitude and enforced lo <laughs> loneliness is quite a different experience um and for many of us um, I think sometimes it was hard enough just to get out of bed and do something, maybe put on some clothes, never mind reach the heights of greatness and busy solitude. Um, choosing solitude is quite a different experience than it being forced upon you. And it being forced upon not just you, but everybody you know, by your local surroundings, your family, your friends, your country, and large parts of the world as well. So it was a very different type of solitude and loneliness that we were experiencing. And I just wanted to take some time to reflect on this because it took us it took a bit of time to adjust to all, didn't it? And these are just some um, images that I pulled together that I think kind of summarise some of the things from last year. Obviously, there's the, the working from home, um, the queuing, physically distanced, of course, the ubiquitous online meetings for everything, for work, for family get-togethers, for everything. Um, online outdoor exercising. I'm not quite sure what those guys are doing in this garden, <laughs> how safe that actually is. Um, and then the kind of the chaos that was in our houses when we all had to live and work at, at home. Now, some people, and I include myself in this, are to be very lucky in the fact that I had actually chosen a bit of a solitary life before pandemic. I'd become a consultant. I was doing my, um, my artistic work as well. So I had a dedicated quiet workspace. I had stable Wi-Fi and I could afford to pay for it. Um, but in fact, actually my worst case of, of nightmare Wi-Fi situation was at this event last year for my home white broadband cut out and I had to quickly uh, shift to my phone obviously a seamless transition um, but you know that wasn't how and it isn't how it is for many of us still so in terms of just to get a bit of feedback from you how have you found that what's the reality of, of the past year been for you is it is it still a bit chaotic or are things kind of settling uh, down um, are you still finding endless rounds of, of online meetings if you can maybe just go into menti and use the code there and, and share a few things just a short thing um have you found a rhythm? Are you still worried about what's going to happen in the next academic year? Or are you just still too tired to actually think about anything else? So maybe you could take a, a couple of minutes and just uh, share what your reality has been like and any part of it as well. Chaotic, yep. <laughs> I think it's still chaotic for a lot of us. Yeah, I think that's a big issue for everyone, isn't it? At the desk. Oh gosh, it's been so destroying. Oh, but getting to know you, hard work. Wow. Oh, and that's interesting. Overwhelming, slow. Yeah, I think perceptions of time and fast and slow have really changed. Yeah, let me just go up here as well. This is great. Never been busier and more engaged, but not engaged, if that makes sense. That makes total sense to me. Yeah, uncertainty for the future. Oh, yeah, editing online for online and then going to have to change things back when you go back to normal. <laughs> I realise the commute is a waste of time. Oh, this is great, the stuff that's coming through here. I will share all these, uh, the, the slides at the end of this as well, so you can see all the co comments. Um, a roller coaster of uh, emotions. Yeah, I think in so many ways the past year has been a roller coaster, hasn't it? It's very intense. Yeah, and that thing, separating home life from work life, a real challenge. I think we're all still working out how to do that. That's great. Thank you so much. 
saying, keep going then. But actually, I thought we might just um, think about what do you think the reality, what do you know the reality has been like for your students? Is it the same for them? Um, do you think they're, you know, are they still feeling chaotic? Um, yeah, lonely and confusing. It's been difficult for students, hasn't it? Yeah, disengaged, demotivating. Hmm. Yeah, social interaction. And I know that's what Sue was covering yesterday about the importance of online social interactions. Yeah, lost motivation. Yeah, mental health issues, really important to think about for everyone. Uh, yeah, the difference between first years and third and fourth, yep. Yeah, stress. Yeah, I think it's it's been an unrealistic, it's been a very different college experience, hasn't it? Lack of joy. Oh. Yeah, it's not a, not a real student experience, but they are resilient and will come through this. Yeah, I think with all your support, you will. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, and that's very true, you know, social care and nursing, you know, balancing being on the a student and working in the front line. And again, you know, all this kind of stress that's been in the, in the context of the pandemic when, you know, so many people have lost their lives. It's just been a tragic, it's been a very, very stressful time um, in so many senses. Yeah, I think there is that feeling of short chains and, and deprived. They're not getting the, the experience that they thought that they would get, that they expected, that society expected they should get, that still expects to some extent extent that they should get well that's really useful um you can keep them coming in but i will uh, share with them and we'll come back to those um points later in the talk so i think um in terms of actually making sense of what that what it's been like in the last year it's quite difficult to do that you know to actually make sense of the lived experience of staff of students of us all and partly because that's because of the pandemic situation you know everyone has been so busy just keeping things afloat um that it has been hard to find time to reflect and that's why weeks like this that events like this are so important because it provides space for people to come together to share to be together and reflect and to learn from each other um and that's really really important and I think the other thing we need to remember is education didn't close. It wasn't like other sectors where they actually were forced to close for a couple of weeks and they could maybe regroup and do things slightly differently. Um, the move online was very, very quick. At times it wasn't pretty, at times it was better than others. Um, and it was difficult to kind of reflect on that because you're doing things. But of course, there, there is more research, there's more data coming through now um, about the experience. And one of the research researchers I've been drawn to her work in particular over the, the, the past year, and I've, I've been an admirer of her work for a long time, is Professor Leslie Gurley from um, the Institute of Education at UCL. And in her, um, I just really like the way that she's been articulating some of the challenges and the lived experiences of, of what everyone's been going through. And her recent paper, There's No Virtual Learning, The Material of Digital Education, she um, really provided a very thought-provoking review of uh, the current context in, in relation to a lot of our lived experiences. I thoroughly recommend the paper if you haven't, haven't read it. And I'm going to probably very badly summarise some of the, the points that Leslie makes. So she de deconstructs this notion of, of the digital and digital environment. Um, because often they're, they're seen to be um, quite different and um, that they're rem completely removed from the physical world and they afford us a, a kind of a different kind of freedom almost from the inhibitions and the distractions of, of the physical world. And this world very much plays into quite a lot of popular neoliberal ed tech visions and solutions for education, you know, just with the right digital service everything will be transformed, all will be well, everything will be personalised, will be datafied and digitised, and we can all be anywhere, uh, we can be anywhere, everywhere, at any time, but only if we have the right devices and enough data to get us there. Of course, the reality of that is, is quite different, and, you know, just looking at some of your responses, we can see that, you know, the understanding where and how we're all interacting online in our virtual or digital learning environments. It's really, really important. 
And we are all really constrained by our physical um, spaces. You know, when you think about it, how many of us and our staff, our students, are we still working and studying in a bedroom, in the corner of a kitchen, anywhere we can get a, find a, a, a space? Um, how difficult is it still to find quiet spaces when you need them? You know, be that for a group meeting or just to find some space to do some reading. It's really challenging, particularly when everyone's um, locked down and at home. Um, part of the work that Leslie did last year was part being part of a, a study uh, called um, MOF, Moving to Online Teaching and Homeworking, that specifically looked at academic experiences of homeworking during the, the first phase of, of lockdown. And they were exploring the spaces that were people um, that were uh, looking at that um, and, you know, where they were. So they were... Um, you know, what impact did it have on your, your professional and your private life? Um, and what was the reality of of being at university? And one of the things she talked about was kind of the various assemblages that people were, were using in their spaces. So they were maybe using ironing boards, boxes to get their screen at the right height. Um, and maybe putting backdrops, a curtain or a sheet to cover up some of the stuff that was behind them. So they had that professional image. Um, now, some of you might have noticed I'm standing doing this presentation. I'm actually using, I don't have a standing desk, but I have got an ironing board, um, a ream of paper and a small desk, a small box that I've got my laptop um, sitting on. Maybe slightly Heath Robinson. It might not live up to stringent health and safety measures, but um, it's a way of me doing something. And also as I was doing this, I was thinking about standing. I mean, when was the last time you stood for a couple of hours? Like, you were all so used to standing giving lectures. We don't do that. We all sit around just now, don't we? So, yeah, there's a lot of impact things that happen on how we present ourselves and, and what we're doing. And that impacts on how we how we are and how we how we can be in our professional um, campuses, uh, campuses. And as Leslie puts it, there are all these different entanglements of our physical and our digital spaces. And our online environments are always mediated by our physical and material realities, by where we actually are. And technology also mediates our interactions too. Um, and another really powerful um, article that I looked at and I was struck by last year was called The Zoom Gaze by Autumn Keynes. I'm not sure if any of you have seen it, but that's another worthwhile article to look at. And it really explores the impact, particularly on the Zoom, because it is quite omnipresent, isn't it? And other similar tools like Teams, like what we're using today, have on our behaviour. You know, we and our surroundings, we're exposed, we're tracked, we're monitored um, through these digital systems. And what actually happens to our data is still a bit fuzzy and unclear in lots of in lots of contexts. We don't really know, I don't think. And yes, we can blur the background in, in Teams and, and we can put another background in in some systems as well, but only if we have the right technology. For example, I can't change my background in Zoom because my laptop's too old. Um, and I'm not just gonna upgrade it so I can put a fancy background in Zoom, tempting as it is to, you know, be on the deck of the uh, Star Trek Enterprise or Doctor Who and the, you know, the TARDIS. And the other thing about web conferencing is it reinforces certain types of behaviour. You know, mics off, as we noticed this morning, you know, signals to ask permission to speak, presenteeism creeping in, you know, forcing our students to show their faces, have your cameras turned on. And unless we really stop and think and enact pedagogies of care, of welcome, some of the work that Maha Bali has been leading on, of inclusion, of accessibility, of open educational practices, which I know Catherine will speak to you about tomorrow. Command and control can so easily become the, dom the default norm. Um, and I had a really stark uh, reminder of this in my own experience. So uh, as Karina mentioned, I'm an artist. And one of the things I do is I go to the life drawing classes every week. But in November, because of different lockdown me measures, they had to go online. So they were done through Zoom. Now, I find this a very discombobulating experience um, for quite a lot of reasons that I couldn't quite articulate until I, I read uh, Autumn's article. Um, I was sitting instead of standing. I was my view was constrained by the screen. But the thing that really struck me was when I went to the first um, class, I automatically switched off my mic and nobody else did in the class. 
And in fact, the, the tutor said, she's like, why have you got your mic switched off? And I was like, why are you asking me that? Because obviously that's what you do when you go into an online situation, you switch off your mic. Um, but you don't have to. And actually, yes, there was a bit of crashing about as other people were moving things, but it settled down really quickly. And you know what? We could all work with um, our mics open. It was fine. But it was a really interesting, reflective experience for me about how technology mediates things. And, and um, I guess what I missed, which I know a lot of our, we're all missing just now, was that emotional connection. I missed the emotional connection with the with the model. I missed the emotional connection with other people in the room as well. So we're all navigating and, and negotiating these new entanglements of the physical and uh, the digital environments and spaces that we're, we're working through. Um, and it's hard for us, you know, as staff, as, you know, um, more experienced people. But, you know, as you've seen in the, the, the comments you put in about the student experience, it's really hard for, for students. How how, how do you be a student in a restricted world? You know, and then a lot of the talks I gave last year, I asked that question, you know, what does it mean to be a student when we're in lockdown, when you can't be on campus, when so many of the conventions of traditional student life have just been taken away? The spaces, the places, informal, informal, that you expect students to be in it's really really difficult to be a student and I think we need to have some serious conversations about that um, if this is going to continue you know in, in some ways um, and yes our virtual learning environments and digital technologies provided spaces for our students but again as I've been talking about they were very much impacted by the immediate surroundings of our students and you know, one thing that has come through very clearly through the, uh, over the past year is, you know, the digital divide and, and digital inequality. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the early claims from the media about how online learning wasn't working, when you actually looked a bit more at the article, it wasn't really about the learning and teaching that wasn't working, because in general that has been working pretty well. It was access to devices, to data. That's what students were struggling with. They didn't have, you know, free Wi-Fi that they would have had at college or university, and they didn't. They were finding it harder to find quiet spaces to access devices that they could use that had specialist software on them. And I think it was Sue that was one of the first pe people that I spoke to who was telling me of a student who was trying to finish finish a dis dissertation on a mobile phone. Well, you know, that's just so difficult and practically impossible. It's really hard to do serious academic work on some devices. And as this um, quote from the index survey said, you know, you can't assume that students have access to device and data. And we have to bear that in mind as we move forward um, as well. So what has this meant for our students um, and what have our students learned um, over the past year? Um, now, Michael mentioned I was going to talk, you know, bring a UK perspective, but actually I think I'm going to use the Irish experience because as luck would have it, um, there's a fantastic video, uh, video from, from a group of students from the EDTL project, which I know Sharon Flynn is going to be talking about a bit more this afternoon as well. And in this uh, video, the students involved, and I wanted to get all their names on the slide as well, they have a really um, free and frank um discussion about their experiences and their hopes for the next year and if you haven't watched it I would really recommend that you need a cup of tea or coffee and sat down and spent an hour watching it and I know that there are lots of things in life when we do things and think well that's an hour of my life that I'm never going to get back hopefully you don't think that about this talk today but this is one of those experiences that I think is definitely worth giving an hour to as an hour well spent. So what I'm going to try and do now is maybe bring together some of the things I've been talking about with what the, the students were saying in, in this video. Um, so these are some of the things that I think we need to be thinking about as we move forward. So the importance of informal time and space is so important. It's what we've been missing in terms of human communication. And I think sometimes what a lot of our technology doesn't provide in a way that we're used to or it doesn't quite work the same way. So the thing that the students have been missing, unsurprisingly, like the rest of us, is each other. I miss people too. 
um, I'm kind of weary of some of the solitude that this lockdown in the past year has imposed on us. But they miss being with others. They miss that collective feeling of, you know, being confused together, um, of seeing that they're not the only one who maybe just doesn't quite understand what's going on. And a really interesting quote from one of the, the students was saying that actually sometimes it's easier to ask for help when you're in, in person, face to face, because you can see you're not the only one that doesn't know what, what's going on. And it's actually quite hard to type, I need help in black and white on a screen. Lots of imposter syndrome things going on and you're missing the social cues of, oh, is it just me there as well? They miss that collective energy of being on campus, of being in a room learning with others, of just, you know, chatting to people informally and the serendipitous things that happen, both in terms of formal learning and informal learning and just being people and getting to know each other. One of the things that I, I find really um, pertinent as well, and I think you all realise, they miss feeling a whole person. They're fed up with just seeing half of of people and I was like yeah I'm a bit like that as well I quite like to see a whole person too as well um they miss making connections and friends and they miss those entanglements of formal and informal spaces that being on campus provides so um we need to think about how we can use space and and, and allow for those opportunities to happen so in terms of as Michael was saying you know when we're moving forward um you know we need to think about what should we invest um, in, in face to face time if and when we get back on campus? Well, like many of us, and that came up in, in the responses that you gave earlier, the students don't miss commu commuting um, at all. Um, and I particularly, you know, somewhere like Galway, um, I've always been amazed at how much traffic there is in Galway as well. So they don't miss them. They like the flexibility that the move to online has provided and they want to keep that. Um, they really liked recorded lectures um, for quite a, a variety of reasons. They liked the flexibility of when they could watch them, but they also liked being able to stop um, to listen and, you know, take notes and then restart and things and do things a bit more self-paced. Um, particularly, as they said, a few of the students said, when lectures are very content heavy, sometimes they found um, when they were in a lecture theatre that it was difficult to get all the content down, meet your notes, and kind of keep engaged in that at the same pace at the lecture. And when they were making those comments, I couldn't help but be reminded of a point made by Jasmine Roberts in her recent OER domain keynote, where she said, we're teaching students not content. Um, and I think we do have to think about that. So we don't have to give all the content to the students in one go in a lecture um, as well. So I think, so interestingly, what students did say that was um, that might not necessarily need to go back to face was that they they found that it was actually easier for them to get contact with their lecturers online. Um, it seemed to be easier to find a slot because staff weren't kind of rushing around campus, going to teach another class, going to do that. So they they actually found that that communication with um, their their lecturers um, was much more was much better online and um, and I think that's probably uh, as well I know that a lot of people have put a huge amount of effort into adding and giving additional support to their students as well but I don't know for you if it has that made that easier to meet students just because you have been online and not rushing around campuses. Um, the other thing that they did find a bit more problematic was tutorials and there was a definite sense that actually tutorials and not lectures were what they would like to have face to face. Um, particularly lab-based work, um, they seem to be a kind of a mix of experiences around about technology and also just some of the maybe the, the more informal one-to-one, -one, you know, I'm not quite sure what we're doing, could you just come over and have a look at what I'm doing? That was missed. Um, conversely, some people said that actually was great screen sharing seemed to work a bit better online. But yeah, they, there was a definite sense that tutorials should be face to face and even for the more discursive tutorials they said that they were actually a bit more challenging online too because the awkward silences were even more awkward online and I think we've probably all all felt that as well you know kind of a silence online can feel much much more intense than a silence in in, in a physical room so I think there needs to be some careful consideration to how we um, as we move back in, into terms of how we develop um, 
and provide tutorial support rather than lecture support and face to face. Now, where and, and how we share information is obviously very um, important. And I think last year, probably lots of us kind of joked um, that it was a bit ironic that it took a global pandemic for some staff, some colleagues to actually engage with their VLE, despite them being have been around for ever almost. Um, but students really like the VLE. They like having information to everything in one place. They like having straightforward communication channels. Um, a couple of things they mentioned were weekly checklists of, 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 of what they were expected to do. They like the fact that some staff were explained to the time to explain to them and show them and walk them through the module area within the VLE. Um, they even like discussion forums and, and the use of a question and answer session. Now, most of us know that none of this is new. We know that students are want consistency, that structure and design make a huge difference to how you use particularly your VLE. Um, we knew that pre-pandemic, but you know, some people could still almost just get away with not doing it. It's not so easy now. And we have, I know there's been a huge amount of work done by people across not across Ireland and all your institutions and everywhere really, you know, to provide support for people to um, find out about designing and, and using uh, virtual learning environments but we have to keep building on that um, and ensuring that there's more consistency for students because it makes sense not just for when we're all online that you know whatever mix or whatever model we're going back to having one place for with well-structured information and uh, resources and, and, and assignment information it just makes sense it does make it easier for the student experience and we have to think of the future because hopefully this won't happen. But, you know, if there is another massive lockdown, then we're going to, not going to be caught out again, but we won't have to scrabble around again to get everything online. But this just becomes default that, you know, we have a kind of hub, central hub for our learning and teaching. Now, the biggie assessments and <laughs> assignments. Um, I did have quite a bit to say about this. And again, I know just how much work that you've all put into um, adapting assessments for a very difficult circumstances. So students generally liked, as Michael said, they liked the move to open book exams in, in particular. Um, but there was a bit of concern about some of the timing of the exams as well. Um, and um, in certain circumstances, people felt that, um, you know, the more open book type exams had, could, they couldn't be fitted in in a, the traditional exam week. So they were being held a bit earlier. And at that point, sometimes not all of the content had been delivered. So there was a sense of things maybe being squished in a bit, um, which is quite a bit problematic because some people, some people might have had to miss a lecture um, on one subject because they had an open book exam in another or they might not have had all the content so they felt maybe not as prepared as they they could be, uh, could have been um, um so that was something to, to think about and i know that is a challenge um you know a lot of um assessments have been moved to assignments and continuous assessments um which was okay but they did feel there was maybe a sense of of, of overload uh, there as well and one student um even said that she kind of couldn't believe she was quite seeing it, but, but she there was a feeling that she kind of missed end of term exams because it was kind of she knew what she had to do. Um, um, so yes, sort of mixed experiences there. And we all know that exams and any kind of assessment is a stressful and an emotional process um, for everyone. It's it's stressful when you're marking as well and very emotional as well. But there was a sense of maybe some unnecessary additional stress being been added to online exams, particularly around um, online cheating. And there was a feeling from the students that actually um, that some of some online exams were being made even more difficult. Um, I think one of the phrases they used were, were just it was just mean. Some of the ways that people were doing MCQs that you couldn't go back, that there was negative marking. So that added to stress because if you looked at a question and thought, I don't know if it's worth me answering this because I don't really know the answer and I can't go back to it. Um, so that, that seemed to add to quite a lot of stress for students. Um, and 
the students know that it doesn't have to be this way. They, they kind of felt that there was maybe an obsession with 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 cheating, um, and they would have much rather to see you know um, a different approach, you know, changing the assessment design to kind of design out cheating, if you like. Um, and what was interesting again was that some of the students were talking about some of the um, their exams had been changed to much more authentic um, assessments based on real world problems and they really really liked that too um so i think there's there's something about the balance of assessments exams assignments that we need to be having a bit more thought and discussion about and again it's been very difficult this year just because of time pressures and trying to get things done but i think there's a lot we can learn from that experience and you know again going back to notions of care and trust in our students trying to think of assessments that are authentic, that design cheating out, that aren't obsessed with kind of stopping um, cheating, you know, that, that presumption that students are going to cheat. And I know that not everyone does that, but um, I think there's some, some thought um, that, that, needs, needs, that needs to be had around about that. And that leads on to group work and, and group work waiting. <laughs> So in terms of group working, um, one of the words that came through quite strongly about from the students was they, they liked the group working online because it was really efficient. They found it very efficient to do group working, which did make me smile. Um, it's efficient once you know the group ground rules. And one of the main reasons it's efficient, efficient is they have a space. They don't have to, you know, run around campus trying to find, a, you know, somewhere to sit, a table, a spare, an empty classroom or whatever. Um, so they find that good. once they knew the ground rules, um, they said it did take a bit of a, while, of a while to get used to using the spaces collaboratively and get them working well. But after a year, they felt that they were quite confident. There. But again, some of the social and more informal aspects of group working were lost because of this efficiency. It's like, we've got to get this done. We've got space, bang, bang, bang. Um, so maybe some, again, more, those more serendipitous, shall we just go for a coffee? Shall we just do that, have a chat? We're lost. Um, and also there was a feeling of, of loss of some of the kind of more informal group working where you're maybe in the lab or in the library and you just you just end up having a chat with someone who's there, some of your colleagues, some of your peers. You might chat about what you're doing. You might help each other and kind of working out what you're trying to do. So they felt that that had been lost as well. So again, I suppose that relates to kind of those informal time and space in, in, in group working uh, as well. The other thing they felt was, and um, one student said that she never had so much group working in her life, that um, it maybe did take over. And we you know group working, you know, is a very effective strategy, and particularly when students are alone, it was a good way of bringing them together. Um, but it can take over. So maybe when we're thinking about our design processes, um, we need to be extending notions of assessment waiting, which we're very familiar with, but thinking maybe about group work waiting as well. And if we are changing the types of assessments and assignments and group work, that balance of group work, um, thinking about the impact of that overall on a module, on a programme and on the overall um, student experience, you know, when do they have to do group working, when are the deadlines, um, how does that fit in with the exams and, and you know, delivery and, and, the, and feedback and those kind of things? Um, so I think maybe we need to extend that and think about how we're, we're weighting our group work uh, as well. And this all kind of leads to timetabling, which is kind of a, a big thing. I don't know if, if you're reviewing timetabling in, in your institution or if you're looking at that, I'm sure you are. And I just wonder sometimes, because I'm not in an institution anymore and you can you can tell me this in the chat or in the questions you know have our notions of timetabling have they really adapted to reflect the new realities and when and if we get back to campus are we just going to be so welded to our pre-pandemic conventions that that's what we'll automatically go back to and we'll maybe lose some of the flexibility that has been so positive over the past year i don't know but there are some big questions that we need to, to ask, and Michael alluded to them in the introduction as well. You know, how how can we, how are we going to bring students and staff back to campus safely and equitably? You know, what could and should hybrid teaching look like? You know, can it work to have some students on campus and some joining online? Will that actually be an equitable experience? And um, how do we develop both the design skills and the teaching 
skills and experience to facilitate this? And you know, what are the risks that are involved? How can we, you know, allow for some low risk experimentation? allow for a bit of failure as well within our curriculum because a lot of things aren't going to work. A lot of things we'll be doing for the first time. How can we share and how can we learn from ourselves and from our students as well? So should we be thinking maybe more flexibly about our notions of, of um, curriculum and semester length um, to accommodate, you know, that mix of flexibility and bringing people back on campus? Um, I know, I don't know if it's the same in Ireland, but certainly in, in my old institution, we used to have endless debates about short, fat or long, thin modules. Endless debates. You know, now, is there a third way? Is hybrid learning a third way? I don't know, but maybe we need to be thinking about that and, and what impact does that have on our kind of our notions of timetabling? Can we actually start thinking about timetabling in informal sessions, um, you know, uh, can we actually have some? Let's have a session that is just about getting used to being back here on campus with each other. And you start to be, you know, a, in air quotes, a real student again. I think in terms of student and staff well-being, I think that could be really important because I think when people get back to campus, it's going to be quite overwhelming. Being with people, I, know, I don't know about you, but, you know, in lockdown is easing um, over here. Um, I'm still quite weary of being in, in spaces with, with lots of people because I haven't done it for such a long time. So it could be quite um, overwhelming. So I think we need to think about space to allow people just to be, just to be together um, and not to put too much academic pressure on them. That's maybe quite controversial, but I think we need to be, be doing that. Um, and can we think about how we repurpose some of our more formal spaces for informal um, opportunities as well? You know, if we are going to use more pre-recorded lectures, then maybe all those lecture theatres aren't going to be so busy all the time. And maybe they could be used or repurposed in, in different ways. So I think that kind of winds up uh, the, the discussion around about how we use learning spaces. Uh, as well but you know I think there's lots we need to think about there and I don't think we should just rush back to sometimes maybe a slightly rosy tinted spectacle view of what things were like pre-pandemic so I think we need to give ourselves time to do that but and of course that is always really challenging um, to get that right um, and it's not easy um, but I don't think we can afford to just go back to, to where we were and we need to learn from each other and we need to provide the informal parts of education that our students have been missing so much and we've been missing so much as well you know we really need to evolve our ways of being online of being on campus of being together in a group and being together alone and I think once we start doing that maybe we'll have a new sense of greatness and ourselves through collective and not just the, the solitary busyness that some of the great people at the beginning of their conversation mentioned. So I know I've kind of bombarded you with quite a lot there, but I just thought to end this, I get a little bit of feedback from, from you. And maybe if you could share just one thing that you have learned this year and that you are using or you intend to use as part of your, oh, look, I've felt practice completely wrong there. That's a, that's a major typo there. <laughs> um, if you could share that, um, yeah, I know I need to check my spelling better, but there may be one thing that you, you could share. And then what I wanted to do was leave the rest of the time that we have um, for some questions. I've given you a lot of questions. I have to say, I don't have it, very many answers, but maybe we can have a discussion about uh, what you think we should be doing as we move forward and what you have learned over the past year. So if there's anything you can um, share in the, in the mentee, that would be, that would be really useful. I think one of the things that I've learned over the past year is maybe patience, a bit more, to have a bit more patience and give people a bit more time. Um, so that's been useful. Um, also, what I have, I think, appreciated more are some of the little things around about care, about just checking in with people, sending people a wee message every now and again. Um, I've really appreciated when people have done that for me. 
um, and I've tried to do the same for others as well. So we'll just give a, a couple of minutes to see if something comes through here, and if not, we'll just go um, into the, the Q and A. Maybe refresh it, Sheila. I think you just oh, refresh it. it. Oh, Sometimes right, there okay. can be a delay. Just give it a refresh because I think people have okay. typed. Uh, they have, sorry. Right. Oh, let me just escape out of that. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, I think it's coming through. Oh. Um, well, I'm, oh, here, we, uh, starting with tier and exit. Yeah, here we are. They're coming through now. I don't know if you can still see that. A bit. I think if you share your screen again. Yeah, share, stop sharing. Yeah, sorry about that. There we are, hopefully. Yeah. Well, they. I don't know whether, again, my internet connection has suddenly gone a bit slow. There are some things coming through there, but what I will do is I will share these um, with you all at the end. Um, oh, yeah, they're coming up there. They're coming up. Yeah, they're coming up now. Yeah, they're just playing differently. Yeah. yeah. Being patient and understanding. Oh. Yeah. Self-care. Yeah, absolutely. That is so important, isn't it? Um. Blended learning can work really well. Keep using the tell tools. Mentimeter, Padlet, Kahoot. Excellent. Um, put yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah, absolutely. Whether that's another colleague or a student. Absolutely. Reflection is always important, but I think it's even more so now. It is rewarding to collaborate with the students on the choice of assessment. Uh, and discovered universal design for learning. And yeah, accessibility. Yep. Um, yes, going to take the best from the digital experience and try and blend it with the new campus learning experience when we know what that is, absolutely. Um, yeah, student voice, getting to know your students. Yeah, absolutely, where the students feel comfortable sharing is really, really important to peer learning and students as a source of feedback. Yeah, they're a really good source of feedback. We sometimes forget that, don't we? Resilience and reflection. Yeah, um, need for that. Take a step back. Pragmatic timetabling. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have to learn. I've learned to love Zoom and fallen out with Collaborate Ultra. Yeah. Learning to be more organised. Great. Importance of checking in with students. Yeah, and I think we maybe must, can't forget that. We need to keep checking in with our students. Yes, virtual meetings can be more fa focused and run on time. Yeah. Um, yes, well, that is, yeah, we are so, so vulnerable, aren't we? Yeah. And I think we can't forget that. I think, certainly over here, I think people think that we're, um, we're slightly immune to everything now because people have been vaccinated. Yeah, keeping in touch with students while they're on placement and how big a challenge that has been when you couldn't get in placement, um, how stressful that would be. But yeah, keeping in touch with your students is really, really important. Yeah, experimenting and trying new things, that's important too. Well, that's a, a great um, a great list of things that you've learned, really, really useful. And as I said, I will share them um, with you, but I'm going to stop sharing now and then going to hand it over to see if we have any um, questions um, for the last bit of the, the session. Well, I'm just gonna have a quick look in the chat. Now we have a hand up. I think Marie Finnegan has her hand up. First. Hi, hi, Sheila. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Marie. Thanks so much for that. It was really interesting. Great to get the perspective of, of a different kind of cohort of students. 
Um, I'm just wondering, was there any feedback on theoretical versus practical subjects and what they would prefer? Uh, there was a bit. Um, and the, the students in, the, in that particular video were quite, they were quite discreet, I would say. So um, I think, um, there, yes, it's difficult to kind of give it. You know, so particularly so for some of the more practical land-based work, they very much wanted, they felt that they needed more. That's when they really needed the face-to-face -face, face -face support. Um, interestingly, I think in more more in terms of theory, it was more about assessment and exams that they, there was. A, I was really quite impressed with how the student under, understood the uh, assessment design and how they could do an assessment that really tech, that really allowed their knowledge them to share their knowledge, not just retention and, and, and regurgitating facts. So they were, you know, it, it was really interesting listening to them talk about, you know, that they knew they had a 90 minute exam, but you couldn't actually cheat. Even if you could access the Internet in, in those 90 minutes, you couldn't actually assimilate that amount of knowledge to answer the questions effectively. So I think that was a key difference. So I think that really struck me was just that. And I don't know whether this is directly because of the pandemic or whether maybe I have under underestimated students' understanding of assessment design, or perhaps it's just because they've been um, exposed to more different types of assessment now. But they, they understood that and they really wanted to be able to show and share their knowledge and understanding, which is ultimately what we want students to do anyway. So I think that's the kind of the closest I could give you to answer I could give you to that. Great. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Sheila. Sheila, I have a question. I'm sure others will have in a moment. I'm just wondering about um, one of the recommendations or one of the points that you made was around experiencing, ex or sorry, uh, uh, encouraging experimentation and allowing for experimentation. And I wonder from your experience or maybe some tips that you've picked up on encouraging experimentation and innovation, and particularly in relation to assessment and getting um, educators to think uh, a little bit outside the box when it comes to transforming assessment. And that we've learned a lot this year, but just any any further um, comments on that? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a difficult one because I think as with all these things, it does um, rely very much in context. I think team teaching, um, I think the importance of working together is really important. And I think that's going to be even more important, particularly in, in, in the coming academic year. Um, I think we need to, if we want to support each other and we want to do things slightly differently, because I think there's kind of a sliding scale of, of transformation. And, and you know, sometimes it's small things that can really have quite um, an impact and a significant transformation of experience. Um, so I think working together can really help. And also that can help, you know, kind of share the load, if you like. So I think sometimes it's hard to do things by yourself, but you can you can plug ahead and, and, and do it. Um, but I think if you've got the support of colleagues, that makes it easier. And also, I think um, in terms of experimentation, because our students and we've all had such a bizarre year, but I think consistency is, is really important as well. And I think we, we all need to have a bit of consistency. So if we can all try and take within our module or within our program, within our school or whatever, if we're all going to maybe try one thing or decide that we're going to do that and then share that experience. So I think it's working together is actually the um, the main thing to do. I actually think that, you know, people have so much experience and they know what to do. I think it's actually allowing people sometimes, um, allowing people the agency to change things and maybe do things slightly quicker than maybe we have done and, and having that, you know, that feedback loop between ourselves and the students. Hmm. Oh, well, thanks, Sheila. Um, I think it's really interesting the points you made about timetabling as well. And what is this new college experience going to look like? And are we going to revert back to, you know, the 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 original timetables that were in place or are we going to shake things up a little bit more and thinking of that hybrid model um, that's emerging. Have you seen examples in the UK where I maybe it's early days at this stage, but have you seen kind of more any radical plans or a particular university that might be leading in changing how their timetables work or 
contact time no, with Susan? I, no, I haven't, Karina, which is why I keep asking because I haven't actually seen that yet. I think it's a huge challenge. It's, you know, like everything, you know, um, it's high risk. It's, you know, how, how do we do But I don't think, you know, we can't, if we are moving to more hybrid um teaching and if we can't have if we are still going to be limited by numbers on campus then things will have to change um i think it's how quickly we adapt to that and actually i think one of the things i think the kind of i think our education systems are a bit like oil tankers they've just kind of kept going because they're very very slow to turn and i don't think even in that i think there have been big changes and obviously moving online has been a huge disruption but, you know, we still pretty much kept our destinations in terms of final outcomes, in terms of assessment. So the, the, the tanker hasn't really kind of changed to the left or to the right. But I think it might need to as we come start to come back on campus, because um, we're going to have to address some things that yeah, we, we didn't before. Or you know, even last year, I think when there were plans to bring students back on campus and we did for a bit, you know, it was just like our spaces weren't fit for purpose anymore. Mm. You know, if you can only have a lecture theatre that can have 400 people that can, that can now only have 40 safely or, or even less, that really impacts on what you can do and how you're actually going to do things. So there's a huge discussion, I think, that needs to be had around timetabling. And if we are going to use more pre-recorded material um, and, again, sort of thinking about how we actually make our spaces, you know, things more flexible for students, you know, offering more tutorials to students so that they, you know, that we're not bringing them on campus and they've got, you know, half an hour, you know, an hour at nine to ten and they don't have anything else from three to four that is really going to impact on students on the student experience as well. It's really difficult if you've got a job, if you've got childcare, if you've got other caring responsibilities, that's really difficult. But also, you know, how can we realistically offer multiple options for tutorials that's not going to actually kill our staff in terms of their workload allocation as well? So there's a huge amount that needs to be considered around timetabling. It's a big discussion that we all need to have. Yeah. OK, thanks, Sheila. I just see, is there any more, um, just look at the chat here, is there any more questions? I think a um, couple of questions here. OK, so Michael Carey is from uh, one of our digital champions. I probably mentioned our digital champion programme that we set up in the last year. Michael is uh, from Letterkenny IT. He's a question here. Would you have any advice or experience regarding transitioning from one virtual learning environment Blackboard to another. Now you're probably for, I, I probably mentioned this before. We have Moodle here in GMIT, and there's Moodle in Sligo and Letterkenny of Blackboard, and we're about to become this new technological university. So I'm sure the VLE is going to be a big question in the future. So um, Michael has just a question there for you, Sheila. Um, I think communication with with staff and students that this is happening consistency around how you get it's a really good time to start thinking about some of the things around consistency about some of the things that have worked and haven't worked over the past year there's a huge amount of experience I think that actually in some ways this is maybe quite a good time to be looking at this because people have had to engage with their VLE um, and hopefully we can see the importance of it it's a great way to put in design you know get people thinking about you know the structure and design and also get them really thinking about how they're teaching as well you know how activity design how that impacts when you're going to do that online or face-to-face -face. so I think it's um, a really good time but I think consistency and communication are, are key um, in any VLE transition um, people can do things I think people have surprised them think themselves with the speed they've been able to do things so I think before we maybe had you know like you know it's going to take us a year and a half to transition and, and move things over we maybe have a chance now to speed things up because people are doing things a bit quicker now as well or maybe that will change but I think consistency and communication are really are really key. Okay does that cover it Michael Carey? Um, and Catherine just made a good point there around the student experience. You really captured that very well. Um, the insights, you know, looking at what students want and prefer and all, all the, you know, the findings um, are fantastic. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, Catherine. She, uh, can you see the comments? I don't know. I can Catherine. see them there. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, yeah, just very inspiring. So um, is there any other questions? I'll just come back. 
Um, I thought it was really interesting. I, I made a note, the big question that you made at the start around how to be a student in a restricted world. You know, it's, um, I particularly feel for our first years, now obviously it's been a, a challenging year for all students, but our first years uh, have not really transitioned into the college experience as we all have experienced in our lifetime. So um, it's it's been really, really tough. And where will they be? They'll be, will they get a college experience that will match, you know, the past when they move into second year? Um, uh, it's a tough one, isn't it? It is. And I think, uh, again, you know, some of the comments I was alluding to in terms of informal spaces and, and making time for these kind of just being at university, being a student, getting used to doing things. I think that's going to be important, yes, for our first year, you know, for incoming students, but also for, you know, our, our second year students who've had a whole year online yeah. for, you know, for third and fourth year students who've missed things as well. I think it's really important to bring people back because things will have changed. So I think having that space just to redefine what a student is and also I think maybe to change some of the dominant narratives around the student. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, that really struck me. There was a lot of criticism of, oh, they're only getting online education as if that's the deficit model. And I think that's because there's just this expectation if you're a student, you're in a big lecture hall, you're going out with your friends. And in fact, lots of the narrative is not nothing to do with the learning and teaching side of things. So I think kind of we need to have a refocus of that. And again, the more that we can share the student stories and, and you know, engage with our students and really rede redefine that and, and allow our students to help our students and us as staff as well is really important. Um, but yeah, being a student is has fundamentally changed, I think. Um, yeah. And we, we can't forget that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Tom, 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 who will be speaking this morning as well, he's just making uh, a point there. Cork has Canva. Oh, did you move to? Oh, and Kerry is uh, uh, Blackboard. So any comments on that, Tom? How is that transition going to um, happen? Um, many people have made the switch using the VLE. That's the main change, the mindset. So I don't know, Tom, did you want to have any comments there or come in? <laughs> He's quiet. <laughs> Tom's never quiet. He's going to come her. in. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're absolutely right. It, yeah. is, it is the mindset. It is. So I think that's the reason and letting people know they're doing it. But again, I'm quite agnostic about VLEs. I think they all pretty much, they're all pretty much of, of a muchness. Oh, I'm going to let Tom come in now. I can't hear you, Tom. But No, I can't hear you, Tom. Is your mic? working um the only challenge for an it viewpoint is the 70 percent fit um that's michael carey no i can't hear you tom we'll need to sort your mic because you're going to be talking this morning <laughs> but it is it is interesting um now i've heard about canva um another one bright space is another virtual learning environment and it's interesting what TU Dublin are going through at the moment because there's multiple virtual learning environments and that have come from uh, DIT are using Brightspace and others are using Blackboard and I think Moodle is in there as well. So I'm sure it's going to be a huge project for TU Dublin. Now yeah. Jessica has her hands up, so I think she's telling us that we have to finish up. <laughs> so <laughs> our time is up. But if there's any last questions, um, does anybody want to come in and ask a question? Don't be shy. Um, love to hear from you. <laughs> and also, you know, I'm on Twitter. Um, you know, if there are any of you want to ask any questions, then do follow up that way. Um, unfortunately, I can't make any more of the sessions this week, but it's been an absolute pleasure to be part of, of this event. And again, thank you to Karina and Jessica and to everyone involved. Um, it's just a privilege to be here. And thank you for sharing with me as well. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of the day. Yeah, and thank you so much, Sheila. Um, just uh, some great messages and ideas and it's fabulous to hear the student perspective. And um, so thank you so much. So really great keynote. I, I, the silence is that everybody's blown away. So by, <laughs> by, your, by, your, by your ideas and uh, messages this morning. So thank you 
Thank you so much, Sheila. I see all the thank yous coming in there. Yeah, so, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate all your thank yous and kind words. Yeah, thanks a million.